With the immune system, as with uh, any physiological process, it's bad if there's too much of it, and it's bad if there's too little of it. So we'll look at alterations of immune function in both directions and see some disease states that uh, are related to each of these alterations. So you can have an excessive immune response, which would be either a hypersensitivity or an autoimmune condition, or you can have a deficient immune response, which would be a um, uh, immunosufficient uh, insufficiency, such as uh, HIV. But again, as I mentioned earlier, there are many ways that you can have an insufficient immune system aside from HIV. Okay, so there's hypersensitivities, and we're going to discuss the four types of hypersensitivity and which cells modulate them and what some of our examples are for each category. And some hypersensitivities will be autoimmunities. Uh, not every hypersensitivity will be autoimmunity, however. So it's, it's sort of autoimmunity fits into the category of hypersensitivity, but there are hypersensitivities other than autoimmunities, if that makes sense. In an autoimmunity, what we mean is that the immune system is attacking its own cells. All of that system we set up that said, hi, I'm Reeves, and I'm only going to allow Reeves cells to live, and Bob cells are the ones that die, that doesn't work in autoimmunity. Autoimmunity sees a Reeves cell, and it sees it as a Bob cell for some reason, and we'll discuss how that is, and it is going to try to do it. A hypersensitivity isn't always about uh, attacking self cells. Um, it can be related to so several different things. So autoimmunity is polygenic and multifactorial. This means more than one gene is involved. We can't just look at one gene and say, okay, there it is, that's multiple sclerosis. We haven't been able to do that. We haven't been able to is isolate one thing that causes autoimmune conditions. We discover many, many genes responsible for autoimmunity. And then it's also multifactorial. We find there typically probably needs to be an environmental trigger for autoimmune conditions. So somebody could have all of the genes for an autoimmune condition, but without an environmental trigger, they may never develop it. And it's honestly poorly understood. Not just me not understanding it, science poorly understands this. Science is saying, okay, why does this one person, why does this twin have an autoimmune disease and this other twin with the exact same genetic profile not have an autoimmune disease? That difference has to be in environmental triggers. So environmental triggers themselves are very complicated. Maybe it's an allergy, maybe it's Epstein-Barr virus or another viral uh, exposure, or maybe it's environmental pollutants. We think maybe lead or uranium or some of the other things that we have in, in Denver in particular um, because we used to have a large smelting plant here and because of our mining history. That could be a very major environmental trigger for a lot of autoimmune conditions. We're still investigating these though. We're still trying to figure out what they are all, all are and if there's something we can do to reduce them, uh, to decrease exposure, uh, and so on. So when somebody has an autoimmune condition, uh, the treatment has to be individualized. Uh, sometimes it'll be based on steroids. Sometimes it'll be immunomodulators or immunosuppressants, or occasionally therapeutic plasma plasmapheresis. If somebody's in a state where they are very quickly destroying their own tissues, plasmapheresis means we can filter out their plasma and we can filter out the antibodies that are attacking their own tissues, and we can put the rest of it back, all of the cells and fluid back. So I think that's kind of cool. Uh, that's a brilliant thing if somebody's in an acute phase of an autoimmune condition. And it would be very dependent on what that autoimmune condition is and how damaging it is in that moment. So again, hypersensitivities, uh, they are. there's going to be four types of them. So once again, when there's multiple types of the same sort of thing, we focus on what makes them different. They usually do not occur on the first exposure. Our first hypersensitivity is going to be allergies. And one thing that happens every once in a while, somebody maybe moves to a new place, and maybe they've been suffering seasonal allergies for a long time, and they move to a new place, and they think, wow, this is amazing. I'm not allergic to anything here. And then the next year, their allergies are back. 
because they have that hypersensitivity, they got exposed to the new pollen and the new area of the different plants. And of course, now they've developed allergies to these new things. Now the real difference between these different types of hypersensitivities are how are the pathways involved. And we're not doing a ton of detail about these individual pathways. So it's going to be hard for us to categorize them this way. I do want to warn, we are grossly oversimplifying what these hypersensitivities actually are. Uh, but you can still get a lot out of it. Uh, we were able last quarter to take a lot of hypersensitivities and put them into one of these categories successfully throughout the entire quarter. So uh, the reality is that hypersensitivities one, two, and three are mediated by either antibodies or B lymphocytes, whereas type four hypersensitivity is mediated by T cells. And that's actually the biggest difference for hypersensitivity type four. But we are going to use some other things to categorize them. And I'll show you some of the issues related to, to using this alternate method. So type one, I think is the easiest and it's allergies. We already know some of the things involved in allergy pathways. You know that they're going to have high IgE because we already learned about that antibody. You know that they're going to have a lot of basophils. They're gonna have, maybe you've heard of mast cells. There's a lot going on in this allergy pathway. Why this is a hypersensitivity? This is a response to foreign cells, pollen or other things. Those are foreign cells, pollen is a cell. It's a plant cell, and it's going to have an antigen that can be recognized as other. Only thing is that pollen could not hurt you. That pollen was incapable of hurting you. So if somebody with allergies is responding really inappropriately to a completely harmless cell, in a way it still makes sense that it's responding to it because it is an other cell. It does say, hi, my name is Pollen, instead of hi, my name is Reeves. So there your body isn't going to distinguish that compared to a bacterium, right? It just sees another cell that needs to be destroyed. And your reaction to it will vary. Maybe you don't have allergies at all. You are very, very fortunate. Maybe you're like me and you're allergic to everything on the planet. I have probably a lot of IgE. I have probably a lot of uh, basophils, mast cells, uh, etc. Now, I want you to remember that allergies are on a continuum. They can be anything from mild, like I just need a daily allergy spray and I'm fine, or it can be life-threatening. Anaphylactic shock is a hypersensitivity reaction. It is a type one hypersensitivity. This is a response to an allergen. And it's, again, it's very rare. It occurs in a very small number of highly allergic individuals. But it is going to initiate all of these inflammatory responses, and it is going to use chemotactic factors to recruit cells. Um, Histamine is part of this pathway as well. And that's about it for type 1 hypersensitivity. I think this is the easiest one to sort of categorize because I think most of us are pretty familiar with allergies. So we can do antihistamines. We can do steroids for this, anticholinergics. Uh, let's go back to this word acetylcholine for just a second. It's going to pop up a couple of times. Remember that this is um, released throughout your nervous system. Your motor neurons are going to release acetylcholine. Your uh, sympathetic and parasympathetic systems both release acetylcholine. If you recall, there's a preganglionic neuron that releases acetylcholine onto nicotinic receptors in both systems and a postganglionic in the parasympathetic that releases acetylcholine onto muscarinic receptors. So that should be review for autonomic nervous system. If not, if you don't remember any of this about the autonomic nervous system, let me know and I'll send you the autonomic worksheet and you can work through that to get up to speed on it. And again, you're in farm, so knowing where acetylcholine goes and what it affects and what it does having anticholinergics, things that block those receptors, that's fine. So that can only help you. Now type two hypersensitivity, we're going to talk about tissues being destroyed. This is going to be about tissue incompatibility is kind of how I categorize it. There's something going on. It's gonna end in cell lysis for the most part. 
<clears throat> so here's here are my favorite examples up here for type 2 hypersensitivity if somebody gets an organ donation this person got a cornea transplant and now they've got graft rejection which again makes sense they have somebody else's cells on their body and their body has said no I see other cells and I'm going to attack it hemolytic disease of the newborn we've discussed this in terms of blood type cross-matching and uh, a mother infant or mother fetus blood type incompatibility uh, when a mother is Rh negative and a fetus is Rh positive and the mother has previous exposure to Rh positive blood probably through a previous pregnancy uh, that leads to erythroblastosis vitalis, or at least it used to before we developed the Rogam shot. So not something we really need to worry about so much anymore. But that is, again, it's about that cell with the foreign antigen being present in a system that recognizes that as other. So this is, again, it's still just tissue incompatibility. Now, here's myasthenia gravis, and we haven't discussed this disease just yet, this disorder just yet. This is a type 2 hypersensitivity. I did check this. I always kind of question it because we've been talking about cell lysis for our type 2 hypersensitivities. Oh, come on, I thought I had an actual page for this. That's lame. Okay, well, I was looking into it earlier. It is categorized as a type 2 hypersensitivity, but the thing that's being destroyed in myasthenia gravis is the acetylcholine receptor at the neuromuscular junction. So remember you have motor neurons and those release acetylcholine onto muscle cells at the neuromuscular junction. So that acetylcholine is necessary for those muscles to contract in response to nervous stimulation. In myasthenia gravis we have progressive destruction of the acetylcholine receptor and that's going to lead to an inability of those muscles to contract. So you're going to have muscle weakness. Uh, there's something that's sort of a, like a, the red flag for myasthenia gravis is the muscle weakness gets worse with exercise and better with rest. So normally when somebody's weak, we tell them to exercise more. That's not going to work in myasthenia gravis because it's a hypersensitivity and it's going to get progressively worse. You are going to see myasthenia gravis a lot, uh, contraindicated for a lot of drugs or, or coming into play for a lot of drugs because anything that acts on acetylcholine is going to impact myasthenia gravis. Or anything that acts on inflammation, um, or anything that acts on probably a few other things, but I would ask Ashley. Now, again, this isn't my favorite example. On the old worksheet, I used to have you give me a prime example for each of these hypersensitivities, something that would work for you to sort of categorize things. I think this is the outlier in this category. I very much prefer one of these graft rejection or hemolytic disease of the newborn as an example for hypersensitivities because we are trying to focus on destruction of cells, not destruction, cytotoxic, cytolytic, tissue specific. Uh, we're trying to specify that we're talking about cells, not. Honestly, I, I can't tell you the physiology of why myasthenia graftis is considered type 2. I'm not sure. Let's see. Type 3 hypersensitivity, immune complex reaction. Now in this one, we still have our working, hi, I'm Reeves, hi, I'm Bob, HLA, you know, our, our antigens are, are correct. Everything's going fine there. What happened with a type 3 hypersensitivity is maybe you had a strep infection or you had a staph infection and your immune system kicked in and you destroyed that bacteria life was good until those antigen antibody complexes were left over and they went to they probably maybe went to like let's say your kidneys you're trying to pee out your precipitated antigens remember that word precipitation that's one of the things that antibodies can do to get rid of antibot or antigens so that they don't implant into your own tissue. So antigen antibody complexes, sometimes we make a mistake and they deposit into your own tissues. Now this can be kind of broad and non-specific. It doesn't necessarily all need to land in one tissue, but it can land in one tissue. 
I think the best example for this is immune complex glomerulonephritis. So you know what the glomerulus is. It's a tufted capillary bed. It's located in your kidneys. It's part of that, it's that filtration stage of your nephron, right? It's that first thing that filters the blood and as that fluid goes into your nephron, you know, tubule system, right? So you're trying to pee out this precipitated antigen antibody complex, but instead it gets stuck in your glomerulus. Your Brita water filter catches it and it's stuck there. So now your immune cells are going around, they're doing their thing, they see all of these antibodies in this place and they see all of these antigens in this place. They see basically a pile of name tags that say, hi, I'm Bob, hi, I'm Bob, hi, I'm Bob. They're gonna go crazy on it. Your immune system is gonna attack your glomerulus just because those antigen antibody complexes are there. It's not a smart system. So this is not the only place that this can happen, but I think it's an excellent example. So for uh, if you had an infection prior, you could also have antigen antibody complexes, let's say, implant into your thyroid gland. And now you just see all of those antigens in your thyroid gland that identify as other, and you go attack your thyroid gland. So this could appear very much auto, as an autoimmune condition. It seems our immune cells are attacking our own cells, the reason for that would be this issue right here of we just have leftovers. Uh, systemic lupus, uh, erythematosus also falls into this category, but I don't think it's as good as an example of an example. So again, just kind of go back to your primo examples for these. Now, type 4 hypersensitivity is a delayed hypersensitivity. This is the longest, uh, the, the, the slowest to develop of all four of these. It's mediated by lymphocytes instead of antibodies. The rest of these were primarily about antibodies, as you can see there. Often, but not always, associated with the epidermis. So I, again, since we are simplifying this, my keyword for this is that it's going to relate to the epidermis. You, if it is about the epidermis, if it is about your skin, it may also involve a haptin molecule, which we've never really addressed what haptins are. Let's just say that they're going to be um, an immune signaling molecule associated with your skin. So maybe somebody uh, changed their brand of um, detergent and now they're having a sort of inflammatory response on their skin, or maybe they have some kind of um, some kind of inflammatory or allergic. So atopic dermatitis would be an example. And again, I'm simplifying by making it about the skin. Real life, there can be actually a variety of places and organs that this would impact, things like your lungs, uh, your liver, your pancreas can all be Im impacted by this. Some sources want to put type 1 diabetes mellitus as a type 4 hypersensitivity. I don't like it. The old edition of the book put uh, type 1 diabetes into a weird hypersensitivity category, and I'm really not a fan of using that as an example. So again, I am simplifying it by making it about the epidermis. It is more about the, the cell, the lymphocyte, and how that it's delayed more than it's about the epidermis. But to simplify it, we're going to talk about skin conditions in terms of type 4 hypersensitivities. Okay, so again, those were all hypersensitivities. Some of them acted as autoimmunity. Uh, uh, let's see. But now we're going to go ahead and move on into deficient immune responses, when the immune system is incapable of acting uh, in, a, in a functional way. So it could be direct. It could be a functional uh, decrease in the immune system from maybe it's congenital. Maybe you were born lacking the, the components necessary for a complete immune system. Or maybe it's a secondary condition. You have a non-immune system disorder. Or maybe you're under treatment for a hypersensitivity that suppresses your immune system. Maybe you have an autoimmune condition, and so they put you on immunomodulators, and now you are, have a deficient immune response. 
Now, some people are uh, born with genetic problems, genetic issues that mean that they can never develop a truly functional immune system. So wiscott aldrich syndrome is X-linked. That means X chromosome linked immunodeficiency disorder. And this actually, this condition actually affects a number of different things. They're going to have a number of congenital issues, among them issues with T and B cells. You know what, I think I'm actually thinking of DeGeorge syndrome for that statement. I'm sorry, I'm going to correct myself. DeGeorge is going to be associated with a lot of other congenital issues in addition to lacking a thyroid. Uh, so they're going to have total or partial, or not thyroid, thymus. Oh my gosh, I'm not rocking it right now. Sorry guys. Okay, so thymus glands. Do we remember what the thymus gland is? So from AMP2, the thymus gland... I consider it like a dojo. This is where your immune cells go to train to become fully functioning, like deadly assassins for the immune system. In order to kill bacteria, in order to kill a virus, we have to learn those techniques. The thymus is where a lot of T cells develop specific immunity. This is the uh, maturation site for T cells. So if somebody is born without a thymus, they are going to be in, able to develop specific T helper lymphocytes and t cytotoxic T lymphocytes that can completely destroy something specific. So somebody with DeGeorge, among other things, will be unable to develop a functioning immune system. To go back to these, sorry I confused those earlier, wiscott aldrich is X-linked deficiency affecting T and B cells. And SCID, Severe Combined Immunodeficiency Disorder, is also impairment of T and B cells, and it is very severe. Reticular dysgenesis, in, uh, specifically, that's the source of that, that bubble boy sort of storyline. This kid was born with so little functioning immune system, so little specific immunity, that he had to be raised in a completely sterile environment. They put him in a bubble. So basically live his life and any toy he was given had to be completely sterilized etc and it's it was very difficult at that time so we'll collect a variety of autoimmune disorders uh, to discuss them individually Hashimoto's thyroiditis we could cover this again under endocrine system we are going to be moving into our systemic approach pretty soon uh, so this has been, I believe, removed from our endocrine lecture. What thing we're going to see in our endocrine lecture is that you can have too much secretion or too little secretion of a gland, depending on the etiology. And Hashimoto's thyroiditis, it's actually pretty crazy. So destruction of the thyroid gland actually initially re causes release of thyroid hormones. So thyroid hormones, we could... Called, there's a couple of variations. They kind of metabolize in different ways. T4 and T3 are both examples of thyroid hormone. So your thyroid hormone actually is stored as colloid within your thyroid gland. As you destroy these thyroid hormone producing cells, initially the colloid just gets released without any kind of um, uh, control. And that actually, for the short term, can lead to hyperthyroid symptoms. And we'll talk more about hyperthyroidism later. But those follicular cells are dead. The immune system has destroyed them. And once you run out of the thyroid that you'd already created, now you have a hypothyroid condition. OK, I have to apologize. This uh, slide is out of order. I actually do have more autoimmune conditions before I move on to chapter 12 and start discussing HIV and AIDS. Um, I was, <laughs> but I did some editing here to fix that a little bit. Okay, so more autoimmune conditions. Addison's disease is going to be insufficiency of adrenal cortex hormone because the immune system attacked the adrenal cortex. Now remember, those adrenal cortex hormones are about um, salt and sugar, and they're about inflammation as well. So they're going to change. Uh, having low hormones is going to cause a lot of issues associated with um, water balance, fluid balance, sodium and potassium balance. 
which is also going to lead to all of these other signs and symptoms, problems with blood pressure moderation, blood sugar moderation. Uh, we are going to see week four the issues related to electrolyte imbalance. Electrolytes are super important and having an imbalance in them is going to cause a number of problems, some of which can be life-threatening, absolutely. Now multiple sclerosis is pretty complex. We have not figured the cause. We haven't discovered the exact cascade of events that leads to one person getting MS and another person with a very similar genetic profile not getting MS. Uh, for the time being, we know that it's autoimmune. We know that there's going to be sort of exacerbation and remission, and that exacerbation phase in which the immune system is attacking parts of the brain, problems with myelin sheath, especially in the central nervous system, it's going to correlate with inflammatory events. If somebody has the flu or they get a cold or any sort of thing that causes inflammation in the short term is going to trigger a cascade of events that kicks the immune system into high gear and makes the immune system attack parts of the brain. Uh, again, it's about the myelin sheath. So remember the cells that make up myelin in the central nervous system are known as oligodendrocytes. <clears throat> We did talk briefly about myasthenia gravis. It is an autoimmune condition. We saw it labeled as a type 2 hypersensitivity. Yes, I was correct, type 2 hypersensitivity. Though it does not lead to cell lysis, it does lead to destruction of acetylcholine receptors, leading to an inability uh, profound muscle weakness and fatigability. So somebody's going to fatigue very easily, especially after exercise. Rheumatoid arthritis is going to be a systemic autoimmune inflammatory disease. Some of the more obvious manifestations are going to be that the immune system is attacking uh, joints, joint spaces. Finding granulo uh, granulation tissue forming over articular cartilage in particular leading to bone erosion, bone cysts, and fissures. So this is going to be a painful disorder of joints, especially non-weight-bearing joints, especially in the hand. And that's one way that we'll see to differentiate it from osteoid, um, osteoarthritis. <clears throat> the classic presentation for RA is that the joints affected are bilaterally symmetrical which means both hands at the same time. Even if you're extremely right-handed or extremely left-handed, you'll feel pain in both of those. Uh, it can go with systemic issues as well. Malaise and fatigue are going to be common as well. We will see SLE quite a few times. We saw it under hypersensitivities. Um, there's going to be joint pain. There's going to be a butterfly rash is sort of characteristic, various types of skin lesions. It is going to be a systemic disease. It's not just a skin disease. It's not just a joint disease. It'll affect joints. It'll affect skin, but also kidneys, blood cells, the brain, the heart, the lungs. Our extreme fatigue is a big issue here. And there's that butterfly rash that's very characteristic. Pemphigus, especially Pemphigus vulgaris, means that blisters erupt onto the skin and that's an autoimmune reaction to keratinocytes and basement membranes so remember your skin cells are called keratinocytes and every epithelium has a basement membrane separating the epithelium from any underlying connective tissue so if your immune system suddenly starts attacking those basement membrane proteins and the skin cells then your skin's going to blister and it, it basically your skin is trying to separate. Your immune system is going to separate you from your skin. And that's pemphigus. Psoriasis is an inflammatory condition. It's an autoimmune condition as well. Uh, it causes a sort of uh, rash appearance, but it is not communicable. It is autoimmune. Okay, now we can finally talk about HIV and AIDS. <laughs> we had that slide earlier. Um, hopefully that edit worked out okay and it's not too confusing. So let's talk about HIV now. 
there is an acquired immunodeficiency virus. So you, a person contracts the virus first. Now AIDS is uh, the progression of the disease. There's a progression of HIV from infection into full-blown AIDS. And when somebody has AIDS, that means they have a low T cell count. So the specifically CD4 cells. The cells that have the CD4 receptor on them, those are T helper lymphocytes. Those are the cells that recognize the foreign antigen and release cytokines that say, hey, you guys, and invite all of the other cells to the party. So that, that virus infects these cells particularly. Now I know you know from micro that HIV is a retrovirus. It's a virus that splices its own viral DNA into your own DNA and it turns your cells into factories for new HIV. The active infection means that HIV is being synthesized by human cells. Now prevalence is highest in Sub-Saharan Africa. That having been said, for a first world nation, America is not doing well uh, in containing the spread of HIV. This may be a little bit out of date. I put this up about, yeah, this is from 2008. But uh, as a first world nation, America is horrifically behind in containing the spread of HIV. As a quick reminder, uh, there is no form of birth control except for condoms that prevents the spread of HIV. Condoms do prevent the spread of HIV. Birth control pills, IUDs, all of those other birth control methods have absolutely no impact on the spread of HIV. Worldwide, as of uh, the at least old editions publishing, 33.3 million people living with HIV infection worldwide would be a better way to phrase this. 1.8 million AIDS death worldwide, most in Sub-Saharan Africa, but always spreading throughout Asia and Eastern Europe and the United States. Let's not pretend we can't, uh, we're, we don't have it here. Over 600,000 in the United States alone and yearly, annually, we get 56,000 new HIV infections. Now the textbook really wants to implicate men who have sex with men and that does remain to a degree a statistic. However, uh, the fastest growing demographic for new HIV infection is no longer a uh, promiscuous uh, homosexual men. At this time, it's now the highest, fastest growing demographic is women of color. Uh, and that's going to be associated with socioeconomic status, levels of education, opportunities, uh, and culture. There's, it's very multifactorial what's going on here. Most people who were raised in the LGBT community have been very well educated about HIV. It's part of the cultural history for, uh, for the LGBT community. Whereas for any other community other than people participating in the LGBT community, it's something that tends to be shoved under the rug. In fact, most of the time in class when I talk about HIV history, the history of the AIDS epidemic, I ask people if they know what happened in the 1980s and what happened um, with the, let's see, Reagan administration. Let's see, AIDS quilt. And most people have not. Uh, most people are unaware that there is an entire administration during the AIDS epidemic that completely ignored the AIDS epidemic. In fact, in the 1980s, before we understood HIV, before we'd really figured out what was happening to our, to our gay community, the Reagan administration didn't even say the words HIV. There was no outcry. There was no public health initiative. That administration completely ignored the people dying and that was very much out of hate. That was very much out of uh, disgust for homosexuals. There was a time when culturally we were referring to it as gay cancer because this HIV, if, when it progresses into AIDS, actually makes cancer more likely to develop. That immune system is so inhibited that even natural killer cells and some of our, um, some of our body's own ways of preventing cancer are 
stopped or, or uh, impeded. And so a lot of people developed cancer as they developed AIDS as well. And so this is the AIDS memorial quilt. This was initially sort of a protest against the Reagan administration's inaction. Every single square on every single quilt re represents a life taken by AIDS in the AIDS epidemic, HIV epidemic. And they keep growing this quilt. Every time somebody dies of HIV, potentially we can add to this quilt. And it's actually Microsoft has been trying to digitize the entire quilt and make it available online. So there's, yeah, there's the Microsoft creating the online version of the, the entire quilt. It's astronomical. And the, the political atmosphere completely ignoring the epidemic as it raged on and not trying to find solutions led to many, many more deaths than were even necessary, than were ever necessary. Let's say none of those were necessary. Now, HIV is a virus, which means it can mutate. There we go. I'm sorry for all of the issues with the slide. I think I meant to change it and repost it last quarter, and I think I forgot to. Maybe I did change it, and I just didn't change it on my own copy. So there are different strains of this virus because it can mutate just like any virus can. The one that is causing most AIDS cases in the United States in particular is HIV-1, and there are even 10 subtypes just of that. There is a milder form known as HIV-2, has a longer latency or asymptomatic period, it's a milder form, has lower mortality rates, but it can still progress to full-blown AIDS, it can still cause those immunosufficient, immunodeficiencies uh, that can lead to death. Most common would be sexual transmission, but also very common is uh, parenteral transmission, some other route, uh, blood, blood products, blood contaminated needles or syringes. So IV drug users are also going to be vulnerable populations for HIV transmission. Perinatal transmission is also possible. However, I have very good news here. For somebody who is HIV positive, if they discover their status and they discover they are pregnant, if they maintain HIV treatment throughout their pregnancy, the chance of perinatal transmission is very, very low. Last I heard, it was less than 2%, and that's extraordinarily extraordinary. Uh, so an HIV mother absolutely can give birth to HIV-negative children. I believe you did this in micro, so I'm not going to do too much with HIV structure. I do just want to point out that our life cycle of HIV is also going to give us our pharmacology for treatment of HIV. Seriously, why? So we know that HIV has to fuse with the cell, so we'll develop fusion inhibitors that block that fusion in the first place. We know that it has to inject its viral RNA, and that has to migrate to the nucleus, and it's going to use reverse transcriptase, an enzyme that's going to splice its DNA into our cells. So if we have reverse transcriptase inhibitors, we can break down that RNA before it gets spliced into human DNA. We know that we're going to have to form this protein and do things to this protein to have that viral RNA uh, created into a new HIV virion. So protease inhibitor inhibitors are going to interrupt formation of new, vir new virions. So all of this life cycle, it's just targets for different HIV cocktail drugs. So we used to say, so let me, let me rephrase this. Um, it's going to take a variety of drugs. There's no one pill that people can take to treat HIV infection. Our drug options get better and better every single year for HIV treatment. And there's also something landmark happening right now 
that has not really made it into the popular collective consciousness yet. So I definitely want you guys to know about PrEP. If somebody is already at high risk of contracting HIV, perhaps it is the partner of somebody who is HIV positive. So HIV positive partner with an HIV negative partner and they're together and they know that the HIV negative one is at an increased risk for contracting HIV. The HIV negative person can now get on pre-exposure prophylaxis, a daily pill that reduces risk of HIV infection. Now that person on PrEP is going to have to be tested for HIV every three months. However, this is already reducing, greatly reducing the transmission of HIV out in the community. And it could be for monogamous couples in which one is HIV positive. It could be in promiscuous people who just know that they're going to be exposed to something. Obviously, there's more ideal situations, but we also don't want to shame people. And again, this is, this is the real. It's out there right now. It's saving lives. It's helping people. Not every healthcare professional is familiar with PrEP right now. I have friends in medical school working on educating the healthcare population on PrEP that it exists so that when somebody comes in and they have a certain lifestyle and they know that they're vulnerable, that the doctor can turn them onto it or so that they don't look like idiots when somebody comes in asking for PrEP. That's the other side of that coin, right? Uh, everybody should know about PrEP. Aside from that, condoms do help prevent the spread of HIV infection. However, condoms are not perfect. Condoms can break, for example, and condom use is rarely ideal. It, when we actually measure people, people's condom use and people using condoms properly, which is to say, you know, there's, there's a lot that goes into condom use. Uh, only about 86% of the time people are using condoms correctly, and that's, that's a massive gap. So we, not everybody can 100% rely on condoms. Now again, we're relying on reverse transcriptase, we're relying on proteases, and that structure and life cycle is gonna give us that pharmacology. So at a certain point, somebody is infected with the virus. For weeks to months, they may have an acute HIV infection, and it may, it's probably going to feel like they have the flu. And that person may not register that there was an HIV infection. There's going to be an extended latent period. And during that latent period that um, HIV is living in those T lymphocytes, and very gradually and very slowly, it's going to replicate. And as it does so, it's going to kill off those T lymphocytes. So you start with a normal number of T lymphocytes. Full-blown AIDS means that your T cells are low. Enough of the T lymphocytes have been killed off. And in contrast, there's very many more of the, your, their viral load is very high for HIV. And that's AIDS. So this person is immunocompromised. A person with AIDS is not going to necessarily die of AIDS. They're, the thing that kills them is going to be an opportunistic infection. So infections that in a typical person would be no big deal, like herpes virus infections. So herpes, you know that you've got uh, herpes simplex viruses one and two, and they like to infect oral mucosa and genital mucosa respectively. Herpes zoster means it's spreading to other tissues or it's inhabiting other tissues, not just oral mucosa. This could be on hands and feet and skin. Uh, it can spread quite for, far. Candida uh, is a yeast that is naturally occurring, but Candida albicans means that this yeast has become infectious and systemic. This would really only happen in an immunocompromised individual. This is not going to happen in a healthy person. And here's our, our really hateful term, gay cancer. Kaposi sarcoma was uh, a form of cancer that really occurred more in the, the HIV positive community than anywhere else. It's pretty rare overall and only common in the HIV community. And it is a cancer in it and it can kill. 
As HIV progresses, there can also be neurologic manifestations, HIV encephalopathy, which means somebody has AIDS and now they have a form of dementia. So cellular damage due to the viral products of HIV infection. I'm going to go ahead and stop there since we're moving into a new um, 